Hollywood lecture. I've been, as, as, as Kenneth pointed out, I've been doing this, this lecture and versions of it for years. This is going to be a somewhat abbreviated version. Uh, when, when we get the all clear, and it's not going to be on May 1st, uh, when, you know, like in, in the years ahead, I do this, I, people actually hire me to do this lecture, but tonight I'm, I'm happy to donate my services to the Federation of Jewish Men's Clubs. And for those of you who are not members, they are the ones who set this, this up. Anyway, let's, let's start with the, the silent era, because when, when movies begin, it's, uh, you know, in the late 19th century, the very end of the 19th century, uh, there's, there's no Jews involved. Jews become involved in the early part of the 20th century with the Nickelodeons, because if you could afford a, to rent a storefront and had a projector and a sheet and some benches, you were in business. And so people like uh, Marcus Lowe and Adolf Zukor and William Fox started to, uh, to do this. And then they started to realize, you know, especially as they were, you know, showing these like 10 minute films. Uh, and then once everybody saw it, what do you do with it? And they realized, wait a second, why don't we make our own movies and we could show them and then we can make money selling copies to other people. And that's really how uh, the, the movie business began. Uh, the, uh, uh, it's, it's interesting, uh, briefly, uh, the, 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 these people, as they're setting up their movie studios, they had to figure out where are they going to do this. Well, uh, movies at that point were shot all over the country, New York, Chicago, Florida. Why did Southern California, and Hollywood in particular, become the center of the movie business? And the reason is something called the Motion Picture Patent Trust Company. This was uh, people like uh, George Eastman of Eastman Kodak and Thomas Edison and all the people who owned the patents on cameras, on film, on film developing, um, and who made sure that you did business with them or you didn't do business. Well, eventually some people decided they didn't like dealing with them. And if they were in Southern California, they were far away from the enforcers for the patent trust company. And if some of the goons showed up, the Mexican border wasn't that far away. So that's really the, 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 the birth of Hollywood. Now, if I've seen a number of uh, silent, uh, a number of silent films, but a number of silent films with Jewish characters. And uh, again, if you're looking for, for something interesting to do with your, with your groups down the road, the National Center for Jewish Film in Brandeis has many of these films. Uh, early uh, images of Jews in the movies uh, were often uh, stock figures because movies were not uh, high class entertainment. They were playing to, to immigrant audiences. And so you, they were often comic. So there's like, there's a movie called Cohen's Fire Sale. Uh, Cohen is, has a, a store, business is in well, he sets fire to it, uh, and you know, that's his fire sale. Uh, there were movie, movies like The Coens and the Kellys and A.B.'s Irish Rose based on the, the Broadway show. Uh, these were a lot of stereotypes, but then all of the characters were stereotypes. It wasn't so much they were picking on Jews, they were picking on everybody. Uh, there were also a number of uh, classical Jewish figures, classical literature uh, Jewish figures uh, from the Bible, but also uh, Shylock from The Merchant of Venice, Fagin from Oliver Twist. Not all of them were uh, complimentary, but they were in the public domain, so they didn't have to pay to do these movies. Then, uh, you, as, as we get into the, uh, the, the more mature part of the silent period, uh, a filmmaker, D.W. Griffith, who was the first great American filmmaker, uh, you know, although is you know, today remembered for Birth of a Nation, but and many other films as well, uh, in, his, in his early period was turning out a short or two, these like 10 minute films every week. And he, you know, he did this over a four or five year period. That's a lot of movies and he needed a lot of material. And that included uh, stories like the 1908 Romance of a Jewess, and the 1913 The Jews' Christmas, which really has to be seen to be believed, because it's the story of um, a, a, a young Jewish man who, whose father you know, brought him to America. The son has totally assimilated. The father has disowned him. And then 
it's Christmas Eve and the grandson is ill and the father's out of work and doesn't have money for the medicine. And so the grandfather pawns, I think it's his prayer shawl and, 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 and sitter to get money to get the medicine for his grandson and a little Christmas tree for the house and everybody's reconciled. And if it's, that sounds kind of silly, remember the message for immigrants in this era was assimilation. You wanted to become Americans. I remember, uh, you know, my mother telling me my my when when uh, my grandparents had her and and my uncle, uh, my grandmother told him, "All right, you're becoming a baseball fan because we're Americans now, and you have to do this." And my my grandfather became a lifelong uh, baseball fan. The uh, early uh, movie studios start really in the late teens, early 1920s. And most of those studios exist in some form today. Uh, Universal, Columbia Pictures, MGM, Paramount, Warner Brothers. Uh, Carl Lamley, who was the founder of Universal, hired so many of his relatives that Ogden Nash wrote a poem about it. And this is the entire poem. Uncle Carl Lamley had a large family. <laughs> that was it. Uh, Louis Mayer at, at MGM had so many relatives on the payroll that the joke in Hollywood was that MGM really stood for Myers Gans Mishpocha, Myers' whole family. It's interesting that in the silent period, there, there's no um, self-consciousness about having Jewish stories and Jewish characters in the mix of all the other things that they were doing. And so it's not surprising that the first real talkie is the jazz singer starring Al Jolson. Uh, it's, a, it's a partial talkie, but it's a fascinating film to look at. And it's the story of a cantor's son who, you know, wants to become a big Broadway star, but then it's Erev Yom Kippur and his father gets sick and who's going to chant Kol Nidre, but it's opening night for the show. It's pure schmaltz. It was pure schmaltz back then, but I have actually over the years got to speak to some people who were old enough to remember seeing it and saying how exciting it was, how amazing it was to suddenly hear voices coming from the screen. Well, by the, by the 1930s, uh, as now talkies take over Hollywood, the Jewish, the, the, the studios are hiring Jewish writers and Jewish actors but oddly, they're keeping Jewish characters off the screen. They suddenly get very self-conscious uh, as groups like the, the Catholic Legion of Decency and the American Legion are talking about who are these foreigners and these, these strange things that they're doing in the movies. They're corrupting our youth. And it's not surprising that in 1933, the production code starts where they, you know, they have to crack down on you know, what's basically have censorship of what's permitted in the movies. But it also, uh, when not required, also uh, eliminated a lot of Jewish characters. So for example, uh, the front page, the famous uh, uh, play, uh, comedy about the newspaper business, in the, uh, the 1930, I think it's 30 or 31 version, there's a character there uh, named Irving Pincus. But by the time it's remade in 1940 as His Girl Friday, he becomes Joe Pettibone. Uh, Golden Boy, the Clifford Odets play, has a boxing promoter named Roxy Gottlieb, not in the 1939 movie version. He's now Roxy Lewis. I guess he changed his name for business reasons. Um, Having a Wonderful Time is a comedy about, set in the Catskills. You can't get more Jewish than that. But by the time it reached the screen, uh, the Rappaports became Beatty's. Uh, Stern became Shaw. It was de-Judaized. Uh, probably the most egregious example is a 1936 movie called Winter Set, uh, based on the Maxwell Anderson play, in which the character of a rabbi in the play, in the movie version, is now a philosophical old man. They just they just totally removed any Jewish context. It's it's very strange to watch these 1930s films and realize that. So you've got something say like um, the life of Emil Zola which you know, centers around the Dreyfus case. I think there's one small instance where they recognize that Dreyfus was Jewish and anti-Semitism was the motivating factor. Uh, Warner Brothers, which was at that time the most liberal 
of the studios. And one of the ones that was famous for tearing their stories from the headlines of the day did a very daring movie in 1939 when America's Not in the War called Confessions of a Nazi Spy. Uh, you, and it starred, in fact, Edward G. Robinson. But uh, if you watch the movie, you would not know that uh, Jews were in danger in, in Europe. Uh, the executives of the studios were basically running away from their Jewish identity. Uh, Harry Cohn uh, was, was, was famous for you know, going to work on Yom Kippur, but he would observe the holiday by not answering the phone that day. Uh, the uh, Danny Kay gets his big break, not at MGM where he first, he first did a screen test, but over at Samuel Goldwyn, because Louis Mayer decided he looked too Jewish. Uh, the probably the most famous story is David O. Selznick was approached by Ben Hecht to uh, give money to uh, the, a war relief fund. It was a Jewish war relief. And, and Selznick goes, you know, I, I'm happy to support charity, but I'm really, I, I'm no more Jewish than anything else. And Hecht, knowing that Selznick was a gambling man, said, all right, I'll make you a deal. I'll call up three non-Jewish friends. If one of them says you're not Jewish, you don't have to make a donation and put your name on as a, as a sponsor. So they, he, I'll do the short version. They call up three people and each one goes, yeah, of course he's Jewish. And by the time they get to, uh, to Leland Hayward, who was one of the big agents in Hollywood, he goes, what are you talking about? Davey's a Jew and he knows he's a Jew. And so Selznick ended up writing the check and becoming a sponsor of Jewish War Relief. The war changed things. Uh, when Once America got into the war and Hollywood uh, backed the war effort in a big way, uh, Jews were now, uh, Jewish characters could be part of the mix because I mean, the cliche was, you know, you had the guys in the foxhole, you had the guy, the guy from Texas and the guy from Brooklyn and you know, the guy from, from Chicago. And so you could have a Jewish character as part of that mix. Uh, so in, um, uh, what is it, uh, in uh, Action of the North Atlantic, Sam Levine co-starred with Humphrey Bogart playing Chip Abrams. And as that same year, George Tobias was assistant crew chief Weinberg in Air Force. So now it, it was part of the mix. It wasn't, they weren't like representing, uh, you know, Jews per se. Very few movies during that era actually acknowledge the fate of the Jews in, in Europe. Uh, one of them, oddly enough, is Charlie Chaplin's The Great Dictator. Now, Chaplin was not, not Jewish, but uh, he was accused of being Jewish in Nazi propaganda films. And Chaplin was a mensch. When he was asked if he was Jewish, his answer was, because they accuse me of being Jewish, I won't deny it. He, he, he refused to go, oh, no, don't call me that terrible thing. He said, no, I'm not going to deny it. If they want to call me Jewish, so be it. Um, but the only other place that I found that actually even touched on, on this during the war was uh, Ernst Lubitsch's To Be or Not To Be. You may know the Mel Brooks remake, but this was in the 1940s with Jack Benny and it's uh, Carol Lombard's last film. And uh, there's... Uh, a, a moment where Felix Bressart, you'd recognize him if you know your old movies, don't worry about it, but he's a member of this Shakespearean uh, acting troupe that Jack Benny is heading, and he goes, they're doing Hamlet, and he goes, well, now I'm just a, a guard, but next time we're doing The Merchant of Venice. Now, we know The Merchant of Venice is being a very problematic uh, depiction of Jews, but Lubitsch, who obviously knew that, uses it very carefully in the movie, and he uses Bressart to, to, to do the famous speech, half not a Jew eyes, if you prick me, do I not bleed, and making a statement of, uh, about understanding and, and discrimination. Uh, after the war, you start to get some movies that uh, deal with anti-Semitism head on. The most famous one, of course, is Gentleman's Agreement, but beating it to the screen by a few weeks was a movie called Crossfire, which does turn up on uh, the, the TCM, if you have that. Uh, Crossfire is uh, Robert Young, uh, Robert Mitchum, 
uh, to Robert Ryan and Sam Levine, who wouldn't change his name to Robert. Uh, and, and Robert Ryan is an anti-Semitic uh, vet who kills Sam Levine. And Mitchum is a good guy vet. And Young is the policeman. And they join forces to trap Ryan and, and bring him to justice. Uh, of course, the gentleman's agreement is the, is the famous one. And uh, when uh, uh, Daryl Zanuck, who is not Jewish, bought the movie rights uh, and found out that Dory Sherry, who was Jewish, was doing Crossfire, Zanuck called him up. He said, how could you be doing Crossfire when I am personally producing Gentleman's Agreement? And, uh, and, and Sherry goes, Daryl, let me tell you something. First of all, you didn't discover anti-Semitism. Second of all, it's going to take more than two movies to wipe it out. So Gentleman's Agreement uh, actually became a, a big hit. And there was actual polling that was done in, I guess it would have been 1948, the year after the movie came out, that showed that attitudes in the American public changed. It was a movie that had a big impact. Uh, did anti-Semitism go down? That I couldn't say, but now people didn't want to admit to having anti-Semitic views. Uh, but still, there was some, some, a lot of self-consciousness in Hollywood. Samuel Goldwyn uh, was given a book about the Jews of Montreal by his wife, and he always listened to what his wife said. And he hires Rigg Lardner Jr., who was not Jewish, to do a screenplay adaptation. And Lardner turns it in, and Goldwyn calls him in for a meeting, and he goes, you know, I hired you because you weren't Jewish, and you betrayed me. You wrote the script like a Jew and ended up not making the movie. Um, by the 1950s, the, uh, the studio chiefs are now dying or getting fired. By the decades and by the end of the 1950s, Jack Warner is the only one of the old moguls who's still in power. Um, Louis Mayer was fired at MGM and replaced by Dory Sherry. Selznick and Goldwyn do their final productions. Harry Cohn, and this is a great story, dies in 1958. And he was a real tough piece of work. He, he, he could be you know, really, uh, you know, really abusive. And when he died, the way the story goes, this may be one of these apocryphal stories, uh, there's a huge memorial service on the Columbia lot. And according to the story, a reporter asks uh, somebody on the lot, I thought Harry Cohn was so disliked. Why are all these people here for this memorial service? And the answer is, well, it just goes to show, you give the public what they want, they'll come out for it every time. By the, by the late 1950s, uh, you now see that Hollywood is now dealing with anti-Semitism as a safe issue. And so you get me and the Colonel with uh, Danny Kaye and Kurt Jurgens as a, I think he's a Jewish tailor and an anti-Semitic Polish military officer who were forced to join forces to flee from the, from the Germans. Uh, 1959, the movie version of the Diary of Anne Frank is made. Um, and also that same year, the Young Lions with Montgomery Clift as a, uh, someone who challenges a small town anti-Semites and wins their respect. Uh, according to this movie, to be Jewish seems to be you're a sensitive New York intellectual. Uh, what's actually interesting, besides all the biblical epics, is that you now, by the late 1950s, Jewish authors have hit the mainstream. People like Bernard Malamud, Saul Bellow, and Philip Roth, and Herman Wouk. And Herman Wouk is really important, not only for the Kane mutiny, in which uh, the Jewish lawyer, Barney Greenwald, is actually allowed to keep his name in the movie version, although he loses the Jewish motivation from the novel. Uh, but then uh, Marjorie Morningstar, which uh, is about, a, a, you know, Natalie Wood is a, a young woman. She wants to change her name and become an actress. Uh, because her real name is Morgan Stern. But this is a movie that shows a Jewish family. It shows them preparing for a bar mitzvah, sitting down for a Passover Seder. We've come a long way from Gentleman's Agreement where Gregory Peck explains to his, his son, oh, Jews are just like everybody else. See, they go to their church. They call it a temple. You know, he's trying to, you know, smooth out all the differences. With Marjorie Morningstar, it says, no, the differences are okay. In the 1960s, it now seems to be, it's now safe for Jews to appear on the screen. You get uh, the movie version of Exodus about the founding of Israel. 
uh, filmmakers like uh, Woody Allen and Mel Brooks and, and Paul Mazursky, uh, you know, get to make movies with very Jewish characters in them. Uh, stars who probably wouldn't have been stars in the 1930s or 40s like Dustin Hoffman and Barbara Streisand become big stars. And you also get these continuous uh, serious takes about the Holocaust like Judgment in Nuremberg and, and most notably The Pawnbroker, which is the uh, first movie to deal with the, the survivor's guilt, somebody who has survived the Holocaust and, and, and that itself is a burden. Uh, in the moving ahead, uh, like I said, I'm doing this a lot faster than I usually do. In the 1970s, uh, uh, Neil Simon is doing The Sunshine Boys, Plaza Suite, The Goodbye Girl, uh, and big musicals. Some of the biggest musicals of the era are extremely Jewish. Uh, Cabaret, Fiddler on the Roof, of course. I suppose you could even argue Jesus Christ Superstar. Um, and you get something new in the depiction of Jewish characters in, in the movies. You start to get a, a number of movies that are about uh, interfaith couples, a, a number of them. Uh, the Heartbreak Kid, uh, The Way We Were with Streisand and Redford, uh, and one of my all-time favorite movies, Annie Hall. Uh, you also get very Jewish Jews, I mean, Jews who are like, they're, they're Jewish characters and they're not apologizing about it. And it's, it, it, there's nothing special. It's who they are. One of the, the best indie films of the era is Hester Street, which is about the, uh, basically about the Jewish immigration experience and with a very young Carol Kane, I think her first movie appearance. Um, you get Ron Liebman is the Jewish labor lawyer and Norma Ray. And this is a movie that you've, if you've never seen, you've got to track down the Frisco Kid with Gene Wilder and Harrison Ford, where, where Gene Wilder is this Polish rabbi at the bottom of his class who's sent to the wild west of America to be a rabbi there for a new congregation in San Francisco. And it's all the misadventures he has along the way. Like at one point he's robbed and he, and he wakes up in his, in his long johns in the middle of a field, everything he's had was, was, was taken. And he sees these guys talking in, in what sounds like German with these long beards. And he goes, ah, Lanzmann. And it turns out they're the Amish. But it's, uh, it's, it's a wonderful film. And, and Harrison Ford plays a bank robber. And the two of them are, you know, it's a buddy film. The two of them have to join forces. And at one point they're fleeing a posse and, and, and Wilder, as the rabbi, refuses to ride because it's Shabbos. And they're watching the sun go down. They goes, okay, now we can ride. In the, by the 1980s, we can finally critique uh, Jewish characters and the Jewish image. So you've got uh, Ordinary People, in which Judd, Judd Hirsch plays the, the Jewish doctor as healer and outsider to this very wasp family that's, that's dealing with the, uh, the death of a son. Uh, Private Benjamin, uh, with Goldie Horn as the prototypical Jewish American princess. Uh, a movie that never could have been made in the 30s or 40s, The Chosen from the Chaim Potok novel. I mean, I'm just trying to imagine Harry Cohn, for example, hearing the premise. Yeah, it's about the friendship between this Orthodox boy and a, you know, a Hasidic boy. Never would have been made. Uh, you also get uh, a Cocoon, which is a wonderful uh, uh, science fiction film with Jack Guilford. You know, it's, it's a group of old people who discover this fountain of youth in the, the swimming pool of their uh, retirement community. And Jack Guilford refuses to dive in. He's, he's a cantankerous old man. He's the one Jewish character. And he goes, no, I'm playing the hand I was dealt. Um, and then something that you might want to share with your kids or grandkids, uh, an American tale, which is about the Mouskowitz family. It's about these Jewish mice coming to America where, the, as the father says, all the streets are paved with cheese. And it's really a wonderful introduction to that, that chapter of history. Uh, by, the, by the end of the century, uh, you had, uh, again, movie moguls seem to be Jewish again. 
uh, over at DreamWorks, Spielberg, Katzenberg, and Geffen, you know, formed a new studio. Uh, Michael Eisner was running Disney. Sumner Redstone was at the top of the food chain at Paramount. Uh, Peter Goober was briefly running Columbia. Uh, the Bronfmans uh, owned Universal. And you had a, a wide variety of, of Jewish films. Uh, one with, uh, that Barry Levinson did a whole series of what's known as his Baltimore films that got increasingly Jewish as they went on. So something like Avalon, which is about several generations of a family that is never identified as Jewish, although there's a scene at a cemetery where you see the Hebrew letters on the tombstones. And what's notable is there's a, a, a running motif in the film of the family uh, gathering, uh, you know, gathering together for Thanksgiving, that that's the American family, you know, the, the American holiday that they're observing. And it becomes a joke at, at the end when as it was pointed out, you couldn't wait, you carved the turkey, you started without me. Um, and then Liberty Heights was the follow-up to that, which uh, actually opens at a, it's a Rosh Hashanah service where the, 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 the two men in the family get up to get a breath of fresh air and stretch their legs a little bit. And when they leave, the two wives look at each other and they go, who are they kidding? They're going down the street to see the new model Cadillacs, which are being released today. There's A Stranger Among Us, one of the, one of the oddest films I've seen. With Melanie Griffith is a non-Jewish a uh, cop who goes undercover in a Hasidic community to solve a crime. And there's, and the only people who know that she's not, you know, that she, who she really is, is the family she's staying with. And there's a scene where late at night she gets up to have a snack and she starts to put a dish in the wrong refrigerator. Now we know what the problem is. She's taken something out of the, the, the Fleischick refrigerator, she's putting it in the dairy refrigerator or something like that. And she, and, and somebody says, stop. And she go, turns around, she goes, okay, I'm doing something wrong. Tell me what I'm doing wrong. And the answer she gets is, well, long ago when we were wandering in the desert and the scene fades out and I'm trying to figure out how they got from there to don't put it in the Fleischer refrigerator. It would be like, oh, what time is it? Well, when we saw the sun in the sky, um, there's uh, indie films with, uh, that deal with the American Jewish experience like uh, Price Above Rubies, a walk on the moon, uh, and you get um, Jews across the spectrum. There's no longer this self-consciousness about, you know, is this good for the Jews or bad for the Jews? So in The American President, Richard Dreyfuss plays a very conservative Republican uh, senator, I think, who happens to be Jewish, or, um, you, or uh, they, I forget who plays the part, but they, they, there's a movie called Lansky, again, about a very Jewish gangster. Uh, there's a number of movies, always, will always be movies about the Holocaust because we can't forget Schindler's List, obviously. Uh, but there's also movies like The Pianist and Sunshine. And there's a movie that Robert Williams did called Jacob the Liar that I'm going to recommend if, you know, again, when you can get out and, and track these films down, see the German original. It's a much better film than, much as I love Robin Williams, it's a much better film than the remake. The premise is, uh, it's at a concentration camp. Uh, Jacob, the main character, overhears a radio broadcast that the allies are getting closer. And he starts passing the word to the other prisoners and it cheers them up. I mean, this is hope. And now they ask him for more and he doesn't have any more and he starts making up stuff to tell them. It's, it's a lovely film. So where, as I said, I promised I would keep this to about a half an hour. So where do we go from here? As you know, we're now 20 years into the 21st century. Well, there are still Jewish characters uh, be in movies, some of them good, some of them not so good. One of my favorites uh, that, I, that I, I recommend is Keeping Up With The Steins about a, uh, a Hollywood agent who is, wants to outdo his rival in planning his son's bar mitzvah. And the opening is the rival's son's bar mitzvah, of the theme of which is the Titanic. And you see the reception where the curtains open, and there's a mock-up of the Titanic, and this gorgeous model is holding up the bar mitzvah boy, and he goes, I'm king of the Torah! And the movie, though, ends up as a really a charming thing about what a bar mitzvah really ought to be about. 
there's also, um, let me see, Keeping the Faith uh, with uh, Ben Stiller and um, Edward Norton as childhood friends. Stiller becomes a rabbi, uh, Norton becomes a priest, and uh, they remain close together. I, I, I rem and, and they, they both, they have this uh, 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 girlfriend uh, played by Jenna Elfman, where the priest obviously can't have a girlfriend, but the rabbi starts to fall for her and she's not Jewish. And I was just sitting there through the whole movie going, please, please don't let this end, th this end up this way. Because at this time I was doing a, a series of talks on movies at my old synagogue and I knew they were gonna blame me for it. And at the end of the film, she, you, you see, she's taking lessons with the senior rabbi played by Eli Wallach to convert. I go, okay, good, I'm off, I'm off the hook. Uh, uh, finally, uh, this, this is the way I like to end this talk. What I would like to see is Hollywood get ahead of the curve. Uh, I would like to see religious observance across the board. Why everything, the only religious Jews we see in movies, for the most part, are Orthodox or Hasidim. Ben Stiller in, in, in Keeping the Faith is one of the few conservative rabbis that I've, I've seen in a movie. Let's see reform and reconstructionists and non, but let's, let's see the whole range of the Jewish experience. Uh, and uh, you know, perhaps that's, that's where we'll know we really have arrived in the movie business. As I said, I promised I'd keep this to a half an hour. So uh, if you'd like to, Unmute, or we can do this through chat and take take some some questions. <clears throat> I've unmuted everybody. Uh, unmute all. Okay, they're all unmuted. Okay. Any, Any questions? questions? Dan, no, I just I want to into silence. <laughs> Dan, I just want to say that I found that fascinating. Thank you very much. Oh, my 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 pleasure. My pleasure. Invite, invite me. Invite me to your synagogue. You know, yeah. you know, next year, like we said at the end of our seder, next year in reality. Yeah, <laughs> next year in person. Yeah, right, right. So obviously, the um, this you know my I, 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 when I do this uh, as as a lecture, uh, you know, and, and people go, wait, you left out this movie. You left. Well, no, I didn't mention every Jewish movie that was ever made. I was just trying to give the, the no, idea of how thing had, things had changed over the century. Well, one thing that uh, I know you don't want to hear who you left out necessarily. Yeah. No, please, but if I, you have a movie that uh, if you not, want to mention, movie, go ahead. Not a movie in particular, but I love the way that Adam yeah. Sandler <clears throat> has um, worked Jewish characters in that are not necessarily Jewish by character, but then you see them having a wedding under yeah, yeah. a something fact, about it makes you yeah. realize that even though it's an everyday character, this person is wow. uh, All uh, right. I used to, when I was teaching a film comedy class, I would, I would tell him in the first class, Adam Sandler is not funny. Put it in your notes. That's a requirement. I just, I, uh -huh. <laughs> Regardless of whether you think he's funny, I like the way he made ordinary characters. Uh, yeah. Just, let, me, let me warn you, never, ever rent Eight Crazy Nights, his animated film about Hanukkah. Don't do it, really. You'll th Listen, if, you, if anybody who's seen it will, will thank me for passing that information along. It's a terrible, terrible film. Other, uh, other questions or comments? There's a number of, of films where um, I think there is a report. There's no way they can pick up their so input. Uh, notably, the Cone, some of the Cone Brothers stuff tends to be conservative. Driving Miss Daisy was, was reform. Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, Driving Miss right. Daisy, in fact, they were, they're members of the temple in Atlanta, which is the big reform temple there. And the rabbi actually was, was, was a character in the movie. Um, yeah. I forget his name. Yeah. Uh, yeah. The, the, with, the, with the Coens, there's, they did a, 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 an explicitly Jewish movie uh, called A Serious Man, yeah, yeah. which I did not like. And when I, at the time the movie came out and I, I would lecture to various groups, the audience would divide. Some people liked it a lot yeah. and some people didn't. I said, you know, my reaction was, okay, you didn't like Hebrew school, don't take it out on the entire Jewish people. There's a, a Simpsons episode, you know, the cartoon show in which Krusty the Clown was oh, one yeah, of the yeah, characters. Yeah. She, he discovers he was never bar mitzvahed. 
And I actually quoted the line in my review of The Serious Man when he goes, <laughs> all my life I thought I was a self-hating Jew. Now it turns out I'm an anti-Semite. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's, it's funny that we've also had uh, recently a number of uh, biblical films. It's the first time in a long time, like in the 50s, there were a number of them. Uh, but in just the last few years, there was, um, let me see, uh, oh, well, the awful Exodus Gods and Kings, which is, which, which was, uh, <laughs> I came out of there, I said, you know, this story is so well known. Why do they think they have to improve it? But the, uh, the film Noah is, is almost like a cinematic midrash on the Noah story and uh, is, is worth a look. Not a great film, but some interesting stuff. The only, my biggest complaint was there's a stowaway on the ark and he eats one of the animals they brought on. I go, well, there goes that species. Oh, God, yeah, I know. Hey, Danny, it's Jonathan Brody. How are you? <laughs> Hi. Great talk. Couple things oh, sure. I want to mention. Um, have you seen The Believer? Uh, is, that, is that the, I'm blanking out the actor's name. Is that, uh, the, tell me what the plot is. I think I have. So the plot is he's an Orthodox Jew. He gets picked on and then becomes an, a Nazi and embraces yes. the Torah. It yes. was actually a very good uh, film. Henry Bean's the uh, screenwriter. Uh, that was one. Um, also, Hunters is streaming on um, Amazon Prime right now. Yes, and I've seen that, and I, I actually discussed it with somebody who's a survivor, and he thought it was a hoot. He would. He yeah, it's was comic not, book graphic. It's, it's right. Graphic he said it's, it's a comic version of Nazi Hunters, and with, with yeah. Al Pacino. Uh, that's on Amazon Prime. And he right has now. an accent too, but yeah, yeah, um, very entertaining. But um, are you watching Fauda? Uh, no. What, what is it's that? an Israeli special forces show. It's it's like a twenty four. It's yeah. uh, on Netflix. It's it's really excellent it's, it, from Israel, and they had also have Unorthodox, which was like Shitzel. Yes, I, that's that's on my list of things to see when I finish all the stuff I'm currently doing. Yeah. It's, it's not totally like I'm going it. anywhere. Right. Exactly. So, but your talk was real informative. Uh, I, yeah. I like Gentleman's Agreement, one of those older films. Really well done. Yeah, I, I have mixed feelings on Gentleman's Agreement, be, but it, you can't exaggerate what an important film it was at the time it came right. out. That's right, at that yeah. time. So, no, Dan? Uh, oh. Yes? No, nope, finish. I'm good. Thanks, Danny. Sure. Um, then there's the, the outlier and total hoot of uh, Hebrew Hammer. Oh, <laughs> they, we they, actually yes. showed it at our show. Yes. Yes, the, 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 the Hebrew Hammer, the, it's, it's sort of like a send up of black exploitation films, yeah, Jew -exploitation <laughs> a, a Jew exploitation film. film. Yeah, with some of, with some of the characters in, in walk ons and, and pieces and, and uh, big parts from the black exploitation films. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a, you gotta have a, a taste for that sort of thing, but it's, it's a very clever send up. All right. Any, any, anything else? I mean, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> How do you do your research? Is it personal? Research. Well, a lot, there are a lot of a lot of good books about. Uh, well, there's books about Jews in the movies. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a, a books uh, like An Empire of Their Own, which is about the Jewish aspect of the movie industry. There are biographies of many of these people. So I pulled this, this information from a lot of different sources. And is your talk going to be online that we can see it or read your notes? Uh, the, this has been recorded and, and there is going to be a link posted. Fantastic. Thank so you. if you want to go back and go, oh, I forgot the title and you can, you can write it down. Thanks, Danny. Okay, I hey, guess. Are, are Danny, we... I have a question. Oh, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, we were watching uh, that uh, special uh, last uh, week about, uh, I guess it had to do with, uh, with Passover, and they, they were mentioning during it that Harold Arlen, when he wrote Over the Rainbow, did it with the, the Holocaust in mind. Do you know anything about that? Um, no, but I'm, I, I, I'm, no, well, actually, he couldn't because Over the Rainbow was for a movie in 1939. Right. So that uh, th there was very limited knowledge, you know, at that time of what was going on in terms of, you know, what the general public knew here. So uh, he, he may have, you know, in retrospect said, you know, that uh, it, it, it connected in his mind, but he couldn't have, 
I don't think he could have written it knowing that. Got it. Thanks. Hey, um, I wanted to. How ask did the Jews you know, get into this business in the first place? As oh, opposed you'll to, you'll have to see the lecture from people. the beginning. <laughs> I, I talked about that. Okay, okay. Valerie. Yes, please. I, um, I was wondering if you have any Jewish sci-fi fantasy movies to recommend. Well, the the one that I I, I mentioned is Cocoon. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That that had that very that, that, that the Jack Guilford character. You know, it's it's, it's like four elderly couples and this alien pod, whatever, I it's been a long time since I've seen the movie, lands in their swimming pool and they find when they go into the pool, it, it, it's like a fountain of youth. And, you know, so uh, very, very much of a, of a science fiction film and, you know, with, with, a, with a Jewish theme to it. Um, no, I can't think uh, off the top of my head. Well, of course, Spaceballs. Oh, yes. Jews in space. It yes. happened. Yes. Yeah, for those of you who don't know, there's a Mel, Mel Brooks send up of Star Wars. Okay, I guess we're gonna wrap this up. So anyway, so thank you all for coming. I hope I hope you enjoyed this. We're gonna get through this. All right. Keep keep the faith, stay healthy, stay sane. May the thank you, Dan. Thank you. May the Schwartz thank, you much. Be with you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. You stay safe. Yeah, you thank stay you, well, and thank you very much. Okay, and a, a link will be posted uh, for of, of the talk. Thanks. Great. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Bye. 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 Stay well, everybody. <laughs>